Son of the God's Word, and if you have your scriptures with you this morning, turn with me to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 36 to 49, and it's entitled Another Appearance, Another Appearance. So let's see what God has to say to us this morning. Let's be open to the prompting of His Spirit and to to lead us into new pastures. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still, still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything else here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. <coughs> then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Amen. Praise God for his word. And uh, when I mentioned our study title this morning to someone in this past week, they asked me, is that about the election? Such is the obsession that we've had in these past days. So much rhetoric, so many folks telling us how this, that, the next thing should happen. And there's never been a more challenging time. And also, in the history of politics, never been such a wide open opportunity for anybody and everybody to be appointed to the Parliament. And so in these days, we need to be praying for those who are candidates and also electorate alike. Scripture reminds us that we have to pray for those in authority. We have to pray for kings and rulers. Let's remember our duties this week as believers. To bring before our whole area. To bring them before the Lord. So that everything that happens during the election time would bring honour and glory to God first and foremost. And not to man and the dishonour that sometimes he can bring. You know, sometimes we've seen in this past week every human emotion imaginable, every human trait coming forth. We've seen the press look into the lives of others, seeking for any small amount of sin, anything that they can grasp hold of, and then suddenly it's over the front pages of the newspaper and another candidate bites the dust. We have to ask ourselves, in the light of Jesus being in our midst, is that a God-honouring way for our society to behave? Where we seek to destroy human beings, where there's no forgiveness or opportunity for restoration, where dog eats dog and one jumps on the other simply to get to the place of power. Candidates run about the country in special coaches, helicopters, limousines, each trying to get one over the other. And few, very few, seeking to say, I will serve. We've heard much about policies. 
We've heard many confident speeches as to what I will do. I will bring about. I will make sure happens. And not a mention of I am under God's authority. In our world today, we need to be reminded afresh of who God is. We need to be reminded afresh as to his son Jesus Christ and how he came to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. And how we must place ourselves as human beings under his authority. And for those who are in human authority, likewise they must submit to the authority of God. And the 7th of May will be a make or break time for so many. And that evening for a lot of people will be a long night of waiting to see what the outcome will be. And human beings since the beginning of time have sought an outcome for life. And this morning we reflect on the appearance of Jesus and we see the central core truth required for every human being to know Jesus personally. And Jesus, if we are to be fully human, Jesus needs to reside in us as personal Saviour and Lord. That is, if we are to realise our full potential in this life. Without Jesus, we are only part human being. With Jesus, we are as God <coughs> has designed us to be. Made in his image. Sadly, there are a few candidates in politics who declare that Jesus is Lord. But the question any candidate has to answer for the believer in Jesus is, what do you think about Jesus? What do you think about Jesus? And if there's a lack of respect, a derogatory stance, and response of words that rob you of the peace of God, then that individual does not deserve to have a vote. And believers, according to Evangelical Alliance and the Christian Institute, have put a call for us to vote and to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, or whatever political representative you want, to make our mark on the paper so that we can make a difference for the next five years in our nation. And that can only happen if we prayerfully seek the Lord as to who we should be voting for. And our civic duty is based on relationship with Jesus and him alone. The future of our country is in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and not in party individuals. Never forget the truth that God is over all, in all, through all, is in control of our nation, and our salvation is not to be found in political party, or political representative. Our salvation is in Christ, in Christ alone, and the rest will be added unto us. And future of nations have risen and fallen on their attitude towards God. Attitude to His ways. The way that they've honoured godly things and shunned evil. How they've treated the poor and the vulnerable. And when the resurrection took place, at the time of Christ, the victory over sin and death was realized. Death could not hold Jesus in its stead, And the way of promise was released for the believer. And no matter what was happening in the world around them, God was in control. Jesus was and is Lord. And when Jesus is Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit, the believer is a hope that is sure and steadfast and certain. And in everything that you'll hear in this coming week up to Thursday, even right up to the last gasp, perhaps even as you walk into the polling station, all the things that are around you, never forget the most important thing is that Jesus is Lord. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, absolutely no one, can come to the Father except through Him. And that includes all who are in authority. And I wonder if this past week you've sensed your peace. Have
fear of peace about the future, about your future. So many folks that I've spoken to over these past weeks have been really fretful. I spoke to, to an incredible number of folks who have almost come to the point of being broken by the stress and the reality of what's going on in our nation and in our world at this time. So many folks who appear on the surface to be coping and managing are falling apart inside. The pressure and the stresses of the world, the burdens are on their shoulders, they're bent double inside to the place of almost breaking. I wonder if you're in that position this morning. The election time has almost exacerbated the whole situation in their lives. The uncertainty <coughs> of what might or might not take place has just kind of brought things to the head. It's the last straw that breaks the camel's back, as it were. Even in the place of work, folks are edgy and are very worried. What's going to happen? Just last week, one of the biggest paper mills in the world decided to close its doors and will no longer manufacture in this country. And it's a place after my own heart because I know quite a number of folks who still work there from my days in Mark Inch. Until I saw so paper mill had the biggest paper making machine in the world. They had just invested phenomenal amounts of money in a bio plant to raise all the electricity so they could run the plant economically. Their main buyer went into financial difficulty because of financial difficulties with their customers. And suddenly, bang, 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 bang. And a company that employs so many folks, many from the same family, goes to the wall. And that's the kind of reality that many folks are actually living in. And what does our scriptures here actually tell us that will help? What, what do we get from this passage? Well, the reality is, when you look at this passage of Scripture, Jesus comes, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. In other words, trust in me. I am the author of peace. I'm the bringer of peace. When I'm in the midst, there will be peace. He doesn't actually say, you know, you're going to have a nice, easy road here. Everything's going to be fantastic. You're going to have a stress-free life. Everything will be wonderful. You'll just sail through life. He doesn't say that. He says, peace be with you. And for many, many believers, and for many in our society today, they need to come back to the place where they realize that peace is not in things that we have, places we go, holidays we want to have, places we want to visit, the goods and chattels that we have. Our peace is not in these things. Our peace is found only in Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. And such is the reality of the resurrection. Jesus breaks the myths of man, the lies of man and the fears of man. And the lies, myths and fears of man are the very thing they break people destroy people. They knock their feet from them. And the only way to bring resolution and to combat that is to find our peace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's very interesting that as you read verse 37, it says they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. I want you to think just for a few moments of all the videos and books that you've seen recently. <coughs> How many are about ghosts, ghouls, vampires, 
all the mythological things that you could possibly imagine. And there's been an obsession and a huge rise in these kind of films and that kind of literature. And it's almost like man has become obsessed with that which is not real in order to find a false god. And in finding all these things and placing themselves into this, almost living and diving into it, it robs them of the peace that can only be found in Jesus Christ. It's amazing how many believers are obsessed with such things. Folks who would proclaim Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord are obsessed about these things. And the believers, they were stacked up and frightened, think they saw, thinking they saw a ghost. And immediately they were blown away with the reality that he was Jesus. No ghost, no ghoul, no myth. Mankind could not have done what Jesus did. The power of God brought him back from the dead. And here he was, standing in the midst, saying, My peace I may give to you. Peace be with you. In other words, receive my peace. Experience my peace. When I'm in the midst, my peace is there. I wonder if God's peace is with you this morning. The reality of the risen Christ. Verse 38 reminds us, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your mind? And certainly you could understand that as folks who weren't actually <coughs> at the time of the tombstone rolling away, it would be very difficult for them to realise that Jesus had risen from the dead. But here he is in front of them. They're confused, they're troubled, they're, they're trying to work it all out. And then Jesus, with gentleness and love, says, Look, here are my hands, here's my feet. Look, it's me. It's me. Believe, trust in me. I can give you peace for the future. My peace I can give to you. If you only receive it. And you know there are lots of folks around us. And there will be a lot of folk around us in this coming week who will be at all at sixes and sevens. The number of folks I've spoken to in the past week who have said, I don't know how I'm going to vote. I don't know what to do. I don't know whether I'm even going to go to the polling station. They're all at sorts. And they're worried sick about what might happen if he gets in or she gets in or this policy gets passed or that policy gets passed. And some of the rhetoric has been unbelievable. And the potential for things to happen has been unbelievable. Perhaps even the most ridiculous one that, uh, and concerning one that I found in this past week has been one particular party's attitude to changing marriage yet again. To include and absorb Polygamy as marriage. And it's not a case of redefining marriage. It's a case of destroying the institution of marriage, as we've seen already. And a lot of folks are worried about this, that, and the next thing. And all the more reason for us, rather than worry, which never adds anything to our height, as the Bible says, where we must be found is on our knees before God pleading for our nation. And I wonder, have you got a peace about the future? Do you honestly believe this morning that Jesus is Lord over our nation? Do you honestly believe that Jesus can change our nation? Do you honestly believe that Jesus can actually transform individuals to make people new? When the hymn writer wrote the words, Burton's and lifted at Calvary. Well, it was 1952, and John M. Moore was serving as the assistant 
of the superintendent of the Siemens Chapel in Glasgow. And he wrote these words. I wrote Buttons are lifted at Calvary after a most interesting experience. The company secretary of a large shipping company contacted me and requested that I visited a young merchant seaman who was lying critically ill in a Glasgow hospital. After gaining permission from the ward's sister, I stood by the bed of a young man and I gave him a track with a picture of Pilgrim's Progress on it. Here was Pilgrim coming out to the foot of the cross with a great burden on his back and suddenly the eyes of the man were open wide. John Moore went on to share of the experience he had of coming to the cross in his own life. His burden of sin rolling away through confession and repentance and receiving Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. And in the place of uncertainty of life, I asked the man, he said, do you want your burdens to roll away? The ones you carry to be lifted today? And the young man nodded. We prayed together, and I will never forget the smile of peace that lit up his face when he said that his burdens were lifted, and now he was at peace with God. Later that night, John Moore, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, took pen and paper and started to write the hymn that has been one which many linked with their day of making peace with God. And these words are very precious words. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. And then the refrain, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Saviour can see every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Do we honestly believe that? This morning. Do we have a peace about the future? Well, as we do have that peace about the future, let us proclaim it and let's share that with those who are broken. Remember what Jesus said in Isaiah. Bind up the brokenhearted. Set free the captives. Those in captivity to whatever. Set them free. Let's obey the manifesto of God and not the manifesto of man. The manifesto of Christ is found in Isaiah 61, the first few verses. Go and read it afresh. And then burdens will be lifted at Calvary because Jesus is very near. And I wonder the words of Jesus bring release I wonder if that's true in your life and in the life of those around you. I wonder if the words of Jesus bring release for your family, for your friends, for your workmates. In this past year we've seen many problems and difficulties of folks who, who have found a place where they neither know how to get free or break free from. They find themselves snared, held in captivity. And the only way they can get out is by trusting in Jesus. Now this is not wishful thinking. This is the reality. Wishful thinking is a thing of man. And man's way to sort things out. The certainties of life can only be found in God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And over the past three weeks, we as a family have had the time to reflect on what it means to be a believer in times of great uncertainty. And we've seen the crushing blows that things in life 
can deal when you have no faith how it affects you. Breakdowns, stress, difficulties. And unless you have Jesus, the only one to cling to in times such as these, then we have nothing left. It doesn't mean to say that the circumstances of life don't affect us. They do. And can powerfully affect us. But it makes us all the more aware of our need to cast ourselves upon Jesus. And the words of Jesus do bring release, do bring peace. The peace that the Bible talks about as being past all understanding, beyond all understanding, beyond all meaning, beyond all knowledge even. We just sense that flood of peace, not something that's drummed up inside us, not some kind of facade that we put on, but something that comes upon us in the power of the Holy Spirit that we just sense. Jesus is Lord. And here we find in our passage this morning, if a practical or saviour meets the believers where they're at, verse 40, he shows them his hands and his feet and said, look, you know, here I am, look, there for see, touch my hands, touch my feet, look, I'm real. I'm not an apparition. And some still, despite that, were struggling to believe fully. He says, well, okay, I realize that this is beyond your understanding. Have you got something to eat? And he's given a piece of fish. And as he takes a piece of fish, he eats it in their presence. Now, Jesus didn't have to do that. But he did so to minister to those at the place of need. And as they saw him eat, they saw that he was alive. Dead men don't eat. When Jesus spoke, he spoke with such words of authority. And the authoritative words of Jesus bring release. If we want to have a sense of release and peace, then we will never find it in the rocks and the place, in the realms of man. In the realms of man, there are rocks which we build upon, the foundations of the law and society and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, if we want peace and we want release, it's only if we place our life upon the rock that cannot move, which is Jesus Christ. And in verse 44, our scripture reminds us, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law and the prophets and Moses and the Psalms. All these things. And God had a plan. Right from the very beginning of time. God had a plan. So that you and I could have life in all its ways. And that plan has been fulfilled. That plan is still in place. We have the opportunity to walk in God's plan and God's purposes. And it's only there that we will find peace and release. We won't find it as the world offers. We'll only find it in Jesus. In verse 45, let us never forget this precious truth. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You know, in our generation, in some fellowships, the Bible is never opened on a Sunday service. I was speaking to a minister not that long ago. He was speaking to a member of a congregation in his area. They had never read the Bible themselves. They'd never been encouraged to read the Bible themselves. In their own church, the Bible was rarely opened. They rarely, if at all, broke bread and took wine in remembrance of Christ. They came together and had a nice time on a Sunday. And the 
Sunday was. It could have been any crop. It could even have been the bingo crop down the road. Because Jesus was not mentioned in any way. That is not a church when Jesus is ignored. When the word of God is not opened, when the word of God is not read, that is not a church unless these things are placed as priority. I wonder if we realize what is written in God's word this morning. I wonder where we stand with Jesus this morning. Someone said to me recently, why do you believe in Jesus? He's a delusion. I said, I don't believe that Jesus is wishful thinking. I believe he is Saviour and Lord. And we had a fantastic conversation over what it means for Jesus to be Lord over your life. You know, when you begin to be open to what God desires from you, God gives you God-given opportunities. And God-given opportunities lead to being able to share God's Word. But how can we share God's Word unless we hear God's Word, read God's Word, and understand God's Word? I wonder if we fully understand the Scriptures this morning. Well, I can honestly say from my own part that there are parts of Scripture I don't fully understand, that I've yet to understand, but will seek to understand. And that's where we should all be at this time of uncertainty, coming back to the Scriptures to understand the Scriptures and to allow the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to open the Scriptures to us. So that we can understand the truths of God. Understand the foundational truths of God. Because God's word is not a lie. It's not a delusion. It's not wishful thinking. It's the truth that sets us free. It is written. Words of God documented for all to read, to digest, and to believe in. It is written. I watched a, an old video clip on YouTube last week. And it was a fantastic clip. There's some good stuff on YouTube. I mean, a lot of rubbish, but some good stuff. And it was Billy Graham preaching. And he stood in this stadium. It looked like a football stadium. And he stood probably in the 1960s, maybe 70s. And he stood facing the crowds, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of folks. And in this short clip, he said, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, the Bible says, and here it is. And he reads the scriptures, shares the scriptures, and then at the end of it says, do you want to believe? And all of a sudden, the choir starts singing, and thousands of folks come forward. They come forward to be released from the shackles and the bonds of life. God set free the prisoners that day in Jesus, his son. And we need to believe in that afresh. Because when we believe in that afresh, great things will come to pass. Transformation will take place. And that, trans that transformation will cause us to do things that we never thought possible. I mean, if you were to say to these particular folks at this particular juncture in time, right, you are going to turn the world upside down. Just in a short time in Jerusalem, there are going to be lots of people added to your number. They'd have probably looked and stared at you. <coughs> 
But yet Jesus said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer, rise from the dead in the third day. Repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have clothed with power from on high. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, nothing was held back. And they were witnesses and shared good news. And the rest is history. When the church does as Jesus commands, the words of Jesus brings release, not only for the individuals concerned, but for those who are as yet still to believe. You know, there have been many revivals over the years. Many times when God's moved in power. And before the Eastern Bloc began to kind of fall apart, there were many pastors who were in prison, many believers who were in prison. And the authorities did not want this Jesus to be even mentioned. They saw him as a threat, and rightly so, because it revealed their evil deeds. Jesus revealed their evil deeds. And as they went into prison, the believers began to share good news in the prisons. And all of a sudden, whole loads of folks came to Christ. Suddenly the prisoners were set free, not from their cells, but from themselves and from their circumstances and from the things in the world. They were set free by faith alone. Suddenly they believed in Jesus and their life was transformed and turned around. The authorities saw this. And they thought, right, get him out of here and put him in a harder prison. Lo and behold, the same thing happened again. Oh no, we can't have this then. Right, send him to the concentration camp. Right, put him in there. Same thing happened again. Oh no, this is just not one. Right, off to Siberia. The place where life expectancy was probably days maybe if you were lucky weeks in the solvent. Same thing happened again. Revival breaks out. Lots of folk come to faith. And even in the place where they had no expectancy, life or otherwise, suddenly hope was in their midst. And the testimony of the people of God and the power of the Holy Spirit changed hearts and minds. And those who were hopeless and helpless, the lowest of the low, suddenly there was love that flowed in a prison which was designed for the unlucky. I wonder if Jesus brings release in your heart this morning. And I wonder if you can catch the vision Jesus wants to reveal to us this morning. <coughs> Jesus did appear. That is true. But what difference will it make in our lives? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we're mindful of the words of Jesus when he said, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. And so, Father, as believers going about our daily lives, Father, help us to live, to live in the reality that Jesus is with us. To fulfill our calling, to fulfill the great commission. Father, this morning, clothe us afresh from on high with power. Set us free, and in that freedom, let us see our nation turned for the good, turned for the better, and made whole and new, with your values to the fore, your truth held dear, because we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.